Hi, my name is Captain Theodore Ashbeck with the Wood County Sheriff's Department, and I'm about to take you on a tour of the Wood County Jail. I uh, get to show you a little bit of, of our space around us and what actually some things do, and the secure areas and the unsecure areas of our facility. Welcome to the Wood County Jail. Uh, the first place that we start is everybody comes to the jail, they come through this if they're on the visitor side or if they're coming down from court. Um, other people will be coming here to meet with their um, family members who may be inside the facility at the time, and this location here is where they would do that. When they added this section on in the late 80s, this would have been fairly good type of technology. As you can see, it's a narrow room. Individuals would sit on each side and then peer through the glass and they would communicate by phone. So there's no actual physical contact, but yet they do get to talk and see their loved one as they're here. Um, you'll notice on the upper side of the ceiling, we have some purple wires up there now. We are now gonna be installing two video booths so that individuals can come here and see their loved ones by video and the videos will be then linked to their cells. So there'll be less movement of inmates throughout the facility. Basically giving them a better opportunity to be able to communicate with their family and still be able to limit the amount of traffic that we move them around inside. Once we're inside the facility, door number two will close, then they'll pop door number one. Both doors have to be closed in order to come in, in order for the next one to open. Now you are entering the Wood County Common Area. This would be where everybody comes into and where they process everybody, and this would be where we'd also release everybody back to the community who served their time with us. The doors behind you, would be the doors that are on the opposite side of the um, video visitation. And then the video visitation, what they would do is we'd open this door, and we'd allow the inmate to come in. They would dial their number, enter their PIN code, and then their voice activated to operate. And then they also have voice recognition and ID, so they know who's talking to who on the other side. And these would all be recorded, except for right now, they're not recorded except for this one, because we use attorneys to be able to meet with their clients due to COVID, so they can communicate back and forth on a non-recorded line. As we go through here, our electronic monitoring office is located right inside of our facility. So individuals who would have um, EMP privileges would have Huber privileges. And then if they have a job or they have a need to go back into our community, we do the ankle monitors and such here, turn the GPS on, get them all set up, and then escort them out. Sergeant's office would be here. This is where we have a sergeant per shift. Each one would be here or on the floor. They actually are working individuals, so they're wandering around the floor with us. The booking area is where everybody comes in and everybody goes out. Um, the little footprints on the floor is where we'd have the individuals walk up. They place their feet in the air. They put their hands on the countertop, and that's where we'd take the property out of their pockets and put, uh, well, make sure they don't have anything on them, for lack of a better term. We would then also then log all their property, which is underneath the camera. So everything we take from you is recorded, and it's audio recorded out here as well, so we know what we told you. The seal on the floor is quite interesting. Um, we had an inmate who spent a lot of time with us who was a master tile worker, and uh, he offered to do this for Wood County back in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, they allowed him to do it. It was quite, quite interesting how that all turned out. But as everybody comes into our facility, as I said, they walk into the footprints. They come through these doors here out of our sally port, which uh, we'll get into that in a few minutes. But they all come to this area. Everybody coming out of this area, going anywhere in the facility, crosses right here. So this is one of our busiest sections of our facility, which is also one of our biggest problems with our facility, is it's hard to keep track of who's going where as they're all mixing through. Um, as you can hear the extreme noise that's going on in here now, you have door control, talking to people out in the lobby, you have people sitting here waiting, people coming and going and being brought back and forth to appointments. Now once we get you booked in, we'll ask you a bunch of questions and we lead you through this way. And this is where we would do your mug shots and take your fingerprints. This is what's known as the mug room. The mug room is where they would take the photograph of the individual. So again, we have a black square on the floor and a gray background, so all the same background for every single photo. The camera is automated and it's through our computer systems and then it'll zoom in on you and take the pictures that we have you hold the little sign we have you turn left and right and those things like that then this machine here is what's known as the fingerprint machine um, it's all digital now so you put your finger on the glass 
and it leaves you fingerprints. You can actually see what it actually captures. The individuals then would print their cards out here, where we then sort everything for the DA's office, the clerk of court's office, and the judges, so that they can all get the pieces of their information that they need at the same time. Um, behind you is quite an interesting little metal box. As I'd mentioned back in the visitation booth, it will actually, we have voice recognition software that runs through our jail. So if you pick up a phone anywhere in our jail that is connected to our inmate secured system, it will record your voice, it will match your voice each time you go through, and the more you talk on the phone, the more it can match you. So it's up to 95 to 98%. Um, there are some speech, I guess, oddities that cause it difficulties. But what we do is we have you read a voice card, and supposedly these sentences set in these order will actually help that system start to recognize me, you, and anyone else that's talking on the phone. That comes in handy when you have phone cards, which is very valuable to the inmates, and individuals can get those numbers, siphon the dollars off, and then use it themselves, and then we don't know who did it. Now we know, because it'll recognize who the individual was who made the phone call. Here we are back in the main hallway. If you take a look from one end to the other, it is 99 yards from that door there to that door way down by the exit sign. We like to say we're right in the middle at booking, but we're really not. We're just a little bit closer to the south side, so we refer to that as south and refer to that as north, and that would be beyond those bars down there. When this place was originally constructed, those bars down there, that would have been your maximum side of your facility, so anybody who was um, class one and two would be housed down there. So in other words, people for homicide or violent crimes would be down there. Everybody else would be this way and more of a dorm set. So you can put people who are likely classified together because then they say you're not likely to have offending. But again, you still go through the whole process to make sure that they don't dislike each other either. So the biggest problem we have with this long hallway is other than the people in the hallway, you can't see anybody inside of the facility itself. So each one of the doors that go off to the sides go to inmates. You cannot see them from here. You physically have to go to the door, and it'd be much like this door right behind us, where you would have to open up to look inside the glass. There is no intercom system for them to communicate outside of the facility. So once they're inside there, the only way they have to communicate with us is, is pounding. So you'll hear pounding every now and again, and you'll see correct and staff looking for where that's coming from to find out what the question is. So 99 yards long distance but you see nothing on either side. So one of our problems is, is it's also 99 yards when you hear the pounding, so you have quite a ways to go looking for it. Um, in our facility, we'll have six holding cells, which during COVID has been rather challenging, so all new people coming in, we go quarantine for 14 days. So we've ended up having to move blocks on this side because there's individual cells in there that we can close doors in order to quarantine people for the 14 days. So in here we have our six, so if you come in and you're not paying attention, don't want to listen, and you're very angry about things, we'll put you up here first, and we'll monitor you to ensure that you're okay until we can get you completely in and get you back down to quarantine. With these cells here, we have the six, as I said. Um, our facility holds 132 people. There's 132 beds, but with classification, that means we're full at about 108 or 109, which today our population is 212. We have 90 people that we contract to keep out at uh, Wapaka, where we have 75, and down in Adams County, where we have 15. Um, now that COVID restrictions are starting to back off, we're starting to climb in our population, and we'll be looking at actually more contracted beds in order to operate our facility. W with a new facility, what it would do is it still allows us to have the capacity to move our people around and start moving them. Once we're full here, then I have to bring in more transport people to put those people in those vehicles and start running our numbers higher in our contracted areas. Adams County, we can only go 15. They won't let us go to 16 or 17. Wapaka County gives us a yearly average, which is a great deal for us, because right now I'll have 72 over there. I could send them 10 more to get to 82, and as long as my yearly average is 75, it doesn't cost us anymore. This would be a typical door of a holding cell. This little door down here is what they refer to as a wicket. This is where you would pass things through to an individual who's inside there. So this is where you'd also put their lunch tray, dinner trays, breakfast trays. They would then pull it inside and then consume the food and put their tray back here. If you needed them to come out of here and they were combative, you would have them kneel down in front of the door, put their hands here, handcuff them here, then release the door to go in. 
you'd have, of course, help with you, so not just myself. Inside this facility here, you'll see the little pads. This is a, individuals that would be on a watch. We would then mark this here button because we would say that Theodore Ashbeck is in holding number four, and then I would push my wand on this button, which says it's occupied, and then I would select one of these, so what's generally going on inside there at the time. If it's empty, I just push the yellow one. So every time you go by, push the yellow button. Inside of our little cell, you'll notice a concrete bunk. We will give you a mattress to go on top. You have your own toilet and your own water supply. Um, the lights do dim in here. We can dim them down for an individual who's having some difficulties but, or if they're doing, trying to sleep. But this would be the area you'd stay in then for the period of time that you're either up here till you can get back into or be put into quarantine in COVID. Prior to COVID, this would have been where you'd stay if there was uh, no room to put you at the moment. If you're also bad and you've done violated the rules in here, this is where you go as well for your disciplinary act. Okay. So we put you here to keep you away from the other people. And I'll close the wicket. Helps if I put the key in correctly. And I'll leave the door open because it's empty. So now we'll head down to the north where we'll get to see two new items. Uh, the state of Wisconsin has upgraded their intoxilizer machine. So if we have a second test in the state of Wisconsin, what we'd utilize is this machine here. So we'd have a person who's coming in for their second blood test or breathalyzer test. So you, you get the option to have an alternate and they would have you come down here and do that. So they would have you blow through the tube when they put the tube on here and it goes through, calibrates, tells you what everything is, gives you a printout and a reading of where your BAC is or blood alcohol concentration is at that time. So that's what this machine does here. This would be the section which would have been our old section for uh, the maximum security. So this gate would then be closed if this was max inmates down here. That is one of the original video monitoring from the late 80s, yeah. It is still working. It still has a little selector switch underneath. It shows you the courtyard outside where we use outside rec. So one of the great things about our facility, and as small as it is, is we are literally the only one this size that actually has an outside rec for individuals yet. So it's nice to be able to get outside. Of course, it's uh, raining. You can't go outside. If it's snowing, you can't go outside. So new facility would have uh, that, th that section built in with a roof on it. So it's like a big garage door on the end. So you can open it so they can get the fresh air on themselves. Or if it's cold, you can close it and they can still go out there. So right now, they can't go outside in the winter. So as we move through, we'll have um, the holding cells is what we're ending up doing with these right now. And you'll notice on the doors, we'll write down holding pre-class and then there's medium. So we'll have individuals move down here when we have a large group of people that came in at one time on quarantine and they're all quarantined together. We can move them all down to one block at the same time and then start moving people here so we can get more people in those quarantine areas. In this section right here, we'll open up door to block F. This would be what is a typical block down on this end of the building, which would be the max side. The max side you'll see when you look in, you'll see a set of bars and you'll see another gate that closes and you can see how it obstructs your vision as you look in. So that's why you would have what they call the port window. The port window they would open up so you could then see around the corner to this side. Because otherwise, when you look at the bars and you look down the bars, it can turn into a black wall on you and you can't see through it. The facility has the gate. The phone is on this side of the gate. They do reach through the bars. They can use it that way, so it's not that it's restricted from them. So in the case of COVID, this gate would be open. Each one of the cell blocks would be closed with the individuals in it. If we have a person out for their rec time or their hour while they're in quarantine. They don't touch anybody else in the bars. They can roam around this area in here, and then this gate would be closed to keep our people safe from them. But then they can still see each one of those individuals, and they'll come in and they will wand this one to show that they've been inside the facility then. If this gate is open, they would walk in, and they would scan this button. 
inside the facility. So prior to COVID, this is the one they would have used. Then they can go and walk by each and every cell to ensure everybody is safe. And then they would be satisfied that everybody's okay. Then they would leave. Uh, this time is when people would ask you if there's this or they would put in the rec uh, requests for certain things and those types of stuff. Um, recreation in this area, as you can see, is kind of devoid of a lot of things. Um, it is not, well, for the lack of better words, there isn't anything to do here other than watch the television. The difference between this and what a newer facility would be, um, obviously the bars wouldn't be here anymore. They do have their own little spaces to be into, so there would still be dividers between each of these locations, so you'd still have your own space that you can go to. The angles of the walls, you'll notice, and these are already starting to do that little modified turn. Th these are in like pods. It's almost like the shape of a stop sign, this section of the jail. And technically, it's almost the shape of what a new podular jail would be, except you have concrete walls keeping you from seeing in. So in the case where a new facility, you'd be able to see in from way down the hallway, as opposed to having to actually enter into here to be able to see inside. Another one of the problems that we've had, you'll notice uh, inside cells like this, in order for airflow to occur, there used to be bars right here. But then people would throw things back and forth, or they would get into fights with one another, or again, unfortunately, it's a place that you could tie on and with a sheet, so we had to get rid of those right away. We unfortunately were, can't get rid of the bars so easily. We had talked to the Department of Corrections about removing these bars because it would be a nice thing to do like in our um, block A, B, C, and D, remove the bars completely, just leave that set of bars there. Then you wouldn't have anything to tie on to. But once we start modifying the inside of the facility, then we have to start following the new rules on space concern. And we probably wouldn't be able to hold five people here. We'd only be able to hold four. So when you take all those away in 132, we already have 212, and you start taking four, five, six, seven, eight beds out, it's really difficult for classification and for population management. On, down here on this end of the facility, uh, we've added our body scanner. That's a new item that we got during COVID. Um, it keeps, uh, it, it, re it reduces the amount of contact you have to have with a person in order to check them. So we'll obviously check them as best we can down here. And then we bring them down here and it's basically an x-ray machine. The only place we had to put it, unfortunately, is way down here because you have to keep it away from a lot of different electronics. So at booking, you have our computers and then you want to add a high powered x-ray machine. Not a good idea. They call it RF. So you get that radio frequency interference and things just don't work. So in this case, we have the blue line on the floor where an inmate stands. The machine then will take your picture so that it has a picture to match up with your x-ray. And then if you have anything on you, it shows all the stuff there. So we'd have a person walk in and very much like when you're up front and you saw the footprints, footprints are the same, has a kind of a shape of a body there. So you have them stand facing the body and then we start the machine. And it would take an x-ray from the backside forward. So I'll show you one of the x-rays. So in this case here, it would be an individual that you had just scanned. And if you thought they had something on them, say in this picture, you can see they have a knife in their pocket. Just the metal blade shows up, the plastic part of the blade does not, but you can see the little outline of it where it would normally be. But plastic is less dense than metal, so as an x-ray, it shows up metal quite easily. So there's very few doors inside the facility that's operated from inside door control, which is another difference between our facility and a new one, is all these would be remotely controlled from inside the facility, including the doors going inside the cell blocks. Well, here we are on the outside of Wood County. Uh, this is where the inmate population gets to go out on a nice day. Um, so we'll be getting people out today because it's obviously quite nice out here. We have the screening over the top. Uh, we do have then the cameras, which you saw on the other one, up in the corners, looking into the facility. There's places you can kind of hide, like right where you're standing now. It would be a little bit difficult to see you on camera. Although you can be seen, it's just not as clear as you would when you start moving out into the view of focus. Um, we have a bench out here for them to sit on. Uh, we used to have a basketball hoop until they climbed up on top of it to try to see if they could push the bars up. Um, this post here, they had left alone until last year. Then we had to end, add these metal posts because they were grabbing a hold of it and shimming all the way up to see if they can push the gate open as well. 
it was more of a game for them, they said, as opposed to an escape attempt. But to us, it all looks the same. Um, you'll see the, con the conduit that's up top here. We had to add that to our facility because the buttons that would turn the lights on and off inside our facility shorted out underneath the floor. So the conduit that runs through the floors it rusted away, causing the wires to short out and knocked out all the power in our two cell blocks. So we had to have them drill a hole, run the power up to get the power over to energize the panel so we could at least turn the lights on and off. In this case, you'll see a panel for cell block A, which is right here, cell block B, which is right here. And in here, split right down the middle, you have A and B. And each one of these here tells you what the gate's doing. So you would see the gate is closed in these cases. You'd see that the lights are on. And then you can see that this gate is closed. And you can see that the shower is on. So they can use, utilize the shower anytime they want. You can see the lights are on. So at night, when you want to turn the lights off, you would touch the bubbles. And I won't do it now, because I'll aggravate a lot of people in there. And then you could also lock and open their cells for them. So all these ones are closed. This one's open, that one's open, and that one's open. These two are closed. So same thing would go for the televisions. I can turn the power off to the TVs in there. So at 10 o'clock at night, when lights are out, we turn the TVs off. These are from the 80s. They don't make parts for these anymore. Um, we did the last upgrade, I think, in 2015, at which time Comtech said, you'll have to upgrade everything from this point forward because they have all the micro switches they can put up there to communicate with the new computers. So once all the computers went to more of a Windows app base, like Windows 10 and further forward, we could only go to Windows 7 or it wouldn't work anymore. They don't have any technologies to patch those pieces together so that it would work. So the communication part with this and new computers aren't possible. You'd have to replace this to get to talk to a newer computer. The scissors we have at every location we can find, they're called cut down tools. So in the event that an individual would utilize any part of their clothing as a ligature, this cuts through pretty much anything. In this section here, this is where we keep a lot of our product. Like I was telling you about, our stuff is kept across the street. We all unwrap the toilet paper, stack it on the shelf. Um, if we have extra um, games for the inmates and donations and stuff, we stack them back there until we start running out. Then we go across the street and bring more over so that we always have some to bring to the people because being inside the jail, there's really nothing more to do. And it sounds kind of odd to say it this way, but the more you give them to do, the less damage they try to do because idle minds, as my grandmother used to say, are the devil's hands. Yeah. <laughs> and if you give them something to do and that helps. This was from the 1950s. So this section of the jail, you can see these little tiles from the 1950s. This is how they would have built the jail inside with the little porcelain tile. This would have been where the outside window was. So when we were in the rec room area, that was that window right on the end down here. And this would have been the outside wall of the 1950s jail. This door leads into the laundry area where you can see the tiles have popped off the floor because the drains had plugged up and collapsed from here over towards the kitchen. So they went in and router routered them things out so you can actually get water through them now. Um, but we had to build a holding tank behind it in order to let the water drain into it so it can get through um, so it doesn't spill out over the floor. Right now, everybody's laundry goes through here. So if you were in the, the north side or south side, wherever you are, Everything gets washed here, everything gets handed out here. All the exchange starts and ends here. Um, we'll have carts where the new ones are all piled on, so we'll go and do some um, linen exchange and uniform exchange with the inmates that are here. And then we'll wash them, bring them back and wash them, put them into these bins, and then stack all the washed material up here so that they have this. Um, we've just added all these here just so, not that long ago. And everything runs into our wash machines. They put it all in the dryers, which are double stacked, fold them all up, and stack them all up until the next person needs them. Then they put them on the cart, and out they go and exchange back and forth. So this would be where our inmate workers do a lot of their time when they're working back here. On our juvenile end, what we ended up doing with it is changing it over and utilizing these spaces, is each one would have had a desk so they could do their homework and their own little section just as it would be. Same type of bars though, because you'd still try to keep everybody apart. So it doesn't look all that much different than the adult side. It just, it was designed for people obviously a little shorter. So they had the, the desks. We had the, this desk over here during time. They had utilized whatever it was and carved the mortar away between the two blocks. So they would pass notes from this block to the next block. So that's why I put our inmate workers here. They're less likely to try to violate the rules. 
record, this would have been the juvenile office at the time. It then became the electronic monitoring office or EMP. And then inside this facility, that glass door window there would have been where you would come in to see the juvenile and then you'd pass your papers and through underneath and that courtroom would have been then your visitation, kind of like what we saw when we first came in our facility. Here's where um, our mental health is now located. Um, she likes it a little bit softer in here, although it still is the jail. We can't change those things because again, if I change anything, I have to meet new DOC standards, so I may not be able to room for that. So then she may meet with an inmate here. We have a camera system up there that we can actually see what's going on for her. It is not audio recorded because of the confidentiality of what they're talking about. And we're not interested in that, we're just interested in safety. Um, one of our storage rooms, any space we can find, we stack all our paper in here, some of the cleaning products that we want to keep away from people that you, if you consume, you could either get intoxicated if it has isopropyl alcohol in it, or you could really harm yourself because of the um, chemical natures of each. As, as you can see, throughout our facility, we utilize all our space for whatever we have the need for right now. Um, our facility was not designed to have a mental health office in it. The new ones do have that. They have um, clinical areas where they can actually meet with them in a safer environment than back in here. Um, here it's very labor intensive to move everybody back and forth to it. Um, but it, it is something that we do because it's important for us to have those types of things going on inside of our facility these days. Um, and it's, we all look around, we can see that there's doors where there shouldn't be, there's windows where there's paint on them in order to keep for some privacy, but we have to do what we have to do inside the facility in order to make it operate at its best efficiency that we can. This is where all the administrative offices are. We compiled them all together, pushed them together because we ran out of space for everybody else. Nobody has their own offices here. We have a cubicle. So my office is in here along with uh, Lieutenant Pearson's office, along with um, two transport officers and our warrants officer and our court officer are all housed in this particular room. It used to be the, the ping pong table room for the exercise for the juveniles. So again, we utilized the room for what it wasn't intended to. So we stack in as much computer stuff as we can, drilled holes in our ceiling to run all our wires down so we can still be in communication, and then built as many storage spaces as we can in order to facilitate our jobs. Problem that we have is that when they're all being booked in up there, all the fingerprints are up there, all the hard copies of everything are up there, these individuals have to go all the way through, grab all that documents, come all the way back here, make sure they're all in the right place, put them all in the right folders, carry them all back and file them up there, then take the copies and send them up to court. So it wouldn't be that way in a new one. They would have their own storage space right there in their offices that would be next to it. Uh, the reason this wouldn't happen in a new facility is when she's having a conversation, I'm having a conversation. If I have a meeting with you, we can't all do it at the same time, but yet here we are. So when he's on the phone talking to the courts, I have to make sure that I'm quiet because that communication has to happen. The warrants officer may be setting up a transport from out of county, out of state, wherever, coming back here. So he's on the phones with everybody. We'll have people calling in. She uh, takes, Lieutenant Pearson takes care of all the nurse stuff, all the mental health stuff. So all that comes back through her. So each person has their own little thing going on at the same time. It's difficult to understand or hear what's going on. So you, in a new facility, you would, you would never do that because it's, if you compile everything in one place, it makes it good for handing a piece of paper off, but it surely doesn't make it for communication. So inside of our facility, this is the hallway that would go to the kitchen. Um, the kitchen also has a dishwasher room where the inmate workers would work in. We have a glass window on this side so we can see the inmate workers who are in here and a metal door on the other side so they couldn't get into the kitchen. Um, in a new facility, they would have double doors on both sides so they'd be able to have them doing food prep and all those other different services for the county in order to try to lower those costs as well. They have lanyards that actually tie them to the table so you can't get them off. And then each time you'd bring your inmates in, you count each one of those items to ensure they're there. You fill out the log that they're there, that you physically touch them, and then you let them in. And then when you let them out, you search them and you physically check to see that all those are back. One of our problems with our facility is it was designed for 132 people. With 212 people, I have to hold all of their property here. So when they go to Wapak or they go to Adams, their clothing they came in on with stays here. And what that does is changes the entire complexity of how we store property. This room would normally not be this full, but we had to put the numbers at the tops all the way along where 
kind of can't see them, but you can see them better on this side because they use a darker color, and the lines down there. So we just assign you a number now instead of your name. Otherwise, it was all alphabetical, so we knew if Ashbeck is in there, it's going to be right here in the A's. Now it's just by number, so we logged a number in there. So I could have number 250, so I would be down on the other side of the building. So now we have to go all over the building to try to figure out where everybody's property is. But this room was so full, we couldn't get another thing in here, so it had to change. But we always keep this door closed, so if you see an inmate in there, let me know. As we come through, this is where the mug room was. This is the back side of the library or the laundry area where they fold and stack all the clothes. Um, this would be the kitchen area, which you can see in. And there's our kitchen manager. Door six, please. So I'll have you walk in first and then turn, come back, and I can explain what you're looking at. Inside our facility, um, we had to replace all the sewer pipelines that comes from the kitchen into the jail which is why when I was telling you back in the laundry that it was flooding, this is part of it. You'll see the different colored tiles on the floor. This is where they had to dig down four feet to get to the pipes in the dirt, except over there where it was over top of the rooms downstairs where it was dripping sewage downstairs. But this going this way is one that we couldn't fix yet. So you'll see the difference of the tile. They stopped right here. Because if they go further this way, they'll have to tear out all the way to the main floor, where we are all the way up, our 99 yard hallway, they'd have to tear all that floor out to get down six to eight feet to it, which means we'd have to shut the entire facility down. We know we're going to have to do it at some point because they are collapsing and deteriorating, but at different rates. Some pipes collapsed way over there. This one was good. That one collapsed, and this one was partially good. So that's why it's kind of hodgepodge in here with the colors. But this is where the inmates would come to do the dishes. Um, we do have a camera up in the corner up there so we can see what the inmates are doing. And then they wash all the dishes, put them all away for us, and then they start to prep over again and you'll see the trays all lined up. The facility is not large enough even to feed the amount of people we have currently today, which I believe is only 65 inside. But as you'll see when you turn the corner, this is where they would set up all the trays. You can see all the trays set here. This is where they would put the food into, then they put them into these carts. They notify us at the time when they're ready, and then we wheel them out, and our staff hands them out to each individual where you saw in the holding cell, the wicket. If you're in there, they slide your tray there, and then they move on. When we had 129 inmates in here, they fed them in shifts almost is what they would do. They would prep as much stuff as they could, get these things in here, get them out of the way, and then start the next section because there was just that many to go. And the carts got heavier, but they're on wheels, it wasn't that bad, but it's just that much more difficult for the people to do the job that they have and yet be able to facilitate enough food to come out of here in that amount of time. Currently we have just the two ovens here. Uh, I know that we had this extra space here. We're looking at adding a second set. Um, we have acquired some through a government grant so they didn't cost us anything, but the issue is, is being able to wire them up, get the gas in here and all those things and not have to shut the entire kitchen down in order to do it. So if we ever had something go wrong with these, we have a set to move in. We have another dishwasher to move in in case this one would fail as well, all through grants that we got through the U.S. government. Um, all the food storage for dry storage is here. So anything you see that's going to be a dry ingredient is going to be kept inside of this facility. The problem they have with it is, is when you start doing a lot of cooking out here, you end up with a lot of humidity. It all goes in there, and it's not designed to pull this amount of air out of here. So again, the air handling system would either have to be upgraded dramatically, or uh, well, you'd have to well change it completely. But a new facility, all this is separate, so it's not inside the kitchen like this. I mean, it's accessible, but it's not right here open to the elements. Um, straight past, you'll see the one glass door. That'd be where they would reach in to grab into the refrigerators. So that little bump on the wall is part of the refrigerator and freezer system. Again, not large enough to hold enough product to feed the inmate population while they're in here. We had some issues where during COVID when they weren't being able to produce as much and then when the highway shut down, we had down south of the United States where it froze everything. We couldn't get things here. They couldn't get them on trucks. So having enough food on hand in order to feed the inmate population is rather important. So we'd run out to grab what we could from local facilities to bring it in. So we'll get a picture of that. 
as you can see, very tight quarters coming through. And this is the space that they have to work in while they're trying to cook and prepare and put everything together for the inmate population. This is the, all the refrigeration that we have is right here. This one is all the freezer space. So anything that comes frozen is in here. Again, not large enough in order to hold enough product to facilitate for the size of facility even that we have today. All right, she's got that door closed. This is how we'd normally do it. I'm gonna close your door on you. This is how we'd have to do this. Oh, sure. So we close secure number seven, door six, please. And that's why we'd have the glass here so we can see in. Oh, it relaxed. They need to be worked on. Normally they stay open until you pull them and then the little wheel releases it. But when they get old, uh, they close right away. This facility is what they call the library. It's actually a multi-purpose room. It's where we do inmate programming. It's where we do uh, meetings with attorneys, where we do uh, meetings with other professionals that come in to do psyche valves and that tough on people, and also where we keep all of our library cards so we can hand those periodicals out through our facility. So come on in. This is the size of the room that we have for the 132 inmates um, as we cycle people in and out. As you can see, it's not very large. We can't mix anybody in classifications. We try not to mix anybody from blocks except during churches, where if they're classified the same, we can bring them in, but COVID again has stopped all that. Um, the facility is set up so that the instructors, say for like uh, Mid-State Technical College, can be up front, log into their computers. We have Wi-Fi set in here, so they can link to what they need to in order to do those educational um, type blocks for themselves. We have the two computers that we have up front and on the side where we bring individuals in here to do their um, research on their own cases um, to try to help during their defense. And it's the same thing with like the law books that are right over here as well. So inmates refer to it as the law library. We refer, we refer to it as the multi-purpose room because it does just about everything. Um, up front, we have the classic chalkboard and we have the monitor system that they'll bring in their laptop, they'll put it in, it links to it, and then they can actually show the class what's going on. This is also an area that we use for staff training. So everybody's fighting for room in this room, and it's the only room in this entire facility that's designed to do this. Um, where in the new facility, each pod area would have its own, well, I guess what you call it is programming rooms. Um, they can also be used for other things where they can have meetings in there. They could do other types of things other than just programming. So we'd be able to have rooms larger than this for the inmate population. Inside of here is where we try to keep everything. This is also our safe room. And by safe room, I mean if I'm the instructor up here and I have the inmates in here and there's a threat towards me or I think there's a threat because that door there will be closed behind us so I have no way out. I retreat in here and close the door. The camera on the outside, we can see what just occurred, and then we get our staff, we come down and we take care of the issue. But at least I have a place to go to be safe. Uh, the other one, facilities, I believe, have that as well, but they can actually egress into a safe place, like when we came through doors one and two, that there'd be a place that we could let them out of the backside. Here, it just goes to a concrete wall, but better safe. But this is where we keep all of our inmate programming stuff. So we'll have some extra books, uh, Mid-State has their stuff that they keep here, and any shelf we can find around the place, we put in here because you always need as much storage as you can get. Storage is a premium here. I mean, if you talk about storing anything inside our facility, there is no more room for that. Uh, currently, there's a building they can refer to as a Red Owl building. It used to be the Red Owl grocery store. It's in the parking lot across the street. That's where we keep all of our extra mattresses for the inmates, so when we need one, we have to go across, but we keep a few of them here. When we need toilet paper, it's all across the street. Bring cases at a time, we bring them over here. And then if we need jail inmate uniforms, or if we have any other needs that we have for hygiene products, we keep all that across the street. So it's not so bad this time of year. You can walk over there at summertime. Wintertime, not so easy. This is what we refer to as the south end of the jail. It's usually anything after our holding cell. So holding number six is right behind us. This would be the south end. There's also, the Huber wing, they like to call it, or the West wing. 
um, however you wish to refer to it. That would have been all Huber, so those doors would get closed there when they were bringing people in and out for Huber, so you still have that double door like what we just talked about in the kitchen. But in this case, we have it open because we're not doing Huber right now. Over here, you'll see G block, H block, and those letters on down the side. Um, this is where there's more of a dorm size setup. You remember looking into the other ones? We'd open up the door. I know there's two people in here. If you wish to look in, it looks like they're sleeping. You could look inside the window and you could see as much as you can see. And this is the reason why we'd have these other windows here so that you could see around the corner. So then you'd come to this window and you'd be able to see more. So inside there is called a dorm style. It's just a bunch of bunks with a concrete wall blocking them all so that they have a little space of their own to sleep. They keep their totes right there by their bed or they keep it at the foot of their bed, wherever they keep it. So we give them the crates in order to do that so that they have a place to keep their stuff and keep it safe. Um, in this case here, this is uh, where our hospital, you can call it the hospital in here. This is what we call it the medical. This is where we bring all the inmates for their 14 day physicals. So every inmate we have in here for 14 or 15 days, they have to have a physical according to the DOC by four, day 14. We try to get those as quickly as we can in order to figure out if there's something we need to be doing for you while you're in here. Quarantine causes a little bit of problem with that is that the, our nursing staff will spend a lot of time checking on those people to see if they're having signs or symptoms. And then they come back here and you'll put on a, a note that you're sick and then they'll make an appointment with you to come see the nurse. Um, the doctor does come through once a week. Those things are very important to us to be able to manage the health of the inmates here. If there's an emergency, the nurse then contacts us. We call the ambulance and they go out. So there's still that part of it yet too. Well, as soon as we go inside this, you'll see it's basically the size of an office or a closet. Um, there's no room for the inmate. There's no room for our staff to be there to ensure that the person is safe while they're there working with them. It's really not much of an exam room. It has kind of a table in there where they can get up and then the nurse can look at you like, would you go to the doctors? This room is, I bet, smaller than any of the, like uh, if you go to um, Aspirus or anything, their exam rooms are even larger than this. And we're setting inmates out here in the hallway. So uh, one of the bigger problems that you have with this is that HIPAA, you can't give out medical. So once an inmate sees somebody sitting along here, they know they're here for medical, which now you're, without them knowing what it is, you're kind of getting into the gray area about whether or not HIPAA is applying. And we know it does, it's just we don't talk about what they're talking about. They don't say what they're looking to do. So we bring them down one at a time now in order to facilitate it, which is extremely labor intensive. So if I have to take a person way down there, 99 yards away, I'm not quite 99, I'm probably about 10, 15 from the end, so if I bring them 75 yards down, they see the nurse for 15, 20 minutes, I have to bring them all the way back, lock them up. We try to schedule it coming this way just for the ease of movement, so you're grabbing the farthest first and bringing them down, and then you take and get your easiest ones in after that. So you, have to, you almost have to do like um, UPS and figure out where your route is before you go. So inside this room, hello everyone, as you'll see, it's not very large, and this is where the inmate would have to come in. You can see there's all the equipment that they have to have here in order to facilitate what they need to do. But again, the space allowed for that is nowhere near adequate in order to really do what we're doing. Again, we're utilizing a space that was not intended to be the nurse's office as a nurse's office in order to have those things that we were required to do inside our facility. This room right here would have been the training room for, the in for our staff. It's also the room that they would have the lockers in. So this room is where the, our staff goes. We'll hold meetings in here as well because we're not, we, we can not compete with the library then so they can use the library and then we can utilize this. This is also their break room and their locker rooms on each side. Uh, the locker rooms again are not of the size you'd want them in order to put anything in there. You can fit a uniform shirt in there at an angle and then it might get caught in the door, might not get caught in the door because they were made for just having a towel or something like that. They're not made for having uniforms or anything else held in there. I know like a lot of the cupboards that are around here when they were shutting down the one building across the street, um, I got permission from the um, maintenance director to go in there to pull out some cupboards, to pull out some sh counters like where we saw the um, intoxilizer. All those are from across the street that I went out, took out myself, brought them over here, cleaned them up, painted them, 
voltage on the walls. Okay. Um, as we go down, we're almost at the end of our building. Uh, we have another um, room down on the end, which we're now using for quarantine. So in this case here, this is where we would go. Uh, we have other people that we have down here. They'd all be the same dorm style. Um, so this one you'll see has nine. We have an ADA bed, which is lower to the ground in case a person is disabled. The going into the shower is just a bump going in, so if they're in a wheelchair, they can roll in, or if they have a walker, they can walk it so they don't have a lip to go in to step over. Same type of controls are down here, but this one you can only open so far. And it'll have the same thing, so you have J block, you control what you do there. Because you have the gates in K, you have these plus the gate up front again. So much as we saw in the other places, you can control these from outside here, but you have a person doing the buttons. The person looking inside to make sure no one's inside the gate because the gate will keep going. And it's intended to keep people from escaping, but it could also be unintentionally used to hurt somebody if they decide to stick their arm or something in there, which you've had people do. And as the bars pass by, you get your arm between them. I'm pretty sure it'll leave a mark at very minimum. So in this case here, we can't really see much into that block because of the configuration of it, but you do have the same ports to be able to see in through both sides. Um, we're now at the end of the facility, so we've traveled our 99 yards. Well, thank you for taking a really comprehensive tour of our current Wood County Jail with uh, Captain Ted Ashbeck. Um, you saw a lot of what we're dealing with right now with the linear style facility and, and how different that is with the, with the newer jail styles. Um, it's unsafe environment back there, and I know a lot of that was pointed out to you. Um, in comparison to you know a newer jail, a popular style jail, it's a it's a much safer environment. It gives the corrections officers the opportunity to see everybody and and notice what they're doing instead of relying on foot traffic and looking through small windows and relying on video cameras. All right, so that's that's a good overview of what you just you just saw. A couple of years ago, um, you know. Our, our management team, along with other county board members, uh, took a really a strong look at our current facility. So one of the big reasons why we're here right now is, uh, as we sat down as a team, we looked at what are some priorities that we have to really look at, and obviously the jail came up. We have a facility that was built in the 1950s, added on in the 1980s, and, and there's a lot of issues going on back there, a lot of maintenance issues that are, are, are coming up that are going to cost the taxpayers a lot of money. And about 20 years ago, um, Wood County went through something similar back then, where they realized, yes, we do need a new jail. But um, you know, at that time, it, it, didn't, it didn't come together where they, they, the county board wanted to move forward financing it. But here's the biggest thing I, I want to point out is, okay, we understand that it wasn't the right time back around 2000. But here we are again, addressing the same issue. We're looking at the same size facility that we were 20 years ago, and what's the biggest difference right now? Well, one of them obviously is the cost. Uh, the facility now is going to cost around 56 to 58 million dollars. Um, back then, it was 23 million dollars. So um, the need has not changed. The need has now become more great. Uh, we house 90 people out of county. That's a, a really, really big cost. Um, it's over 1.3 million dollars a year with contracts, along with transporting um, these inmates back and forth to Wood County. Once people are arrested here, if we have to take them to a Packer or Adams, we're taking them there. Then we bring them back when they get released. So that inmate population here might seem somewhat transient, but everybody is going coming in and out of this facility, um, all of our inmates. So that's been a, a big concern of ours are those costs of housing people out of county. Um, like I said, it's over a point, you know, $1.3 million now. I can guarantee those costs are going to go up. Our contracts with both facilities, Wapak and Adams County, are going to be up at the end of 2022. So we need to, the timing of this, looking at a new facility, part of the out-of-county housing cost fits. And then plus with all the, the issues that we're having back with the, the current facility, with the age and, and the, the upkeep and um, the issues that were, are going on back there, not to mention our insurance issues. You know, you've got a facility that isn't safe. All right, and bottom line, it, it's not safe. You have a linear design. Our correction staff have a hard time seeing the inmates and monitoring them as closely as they should be. 
And we've had some tragedies, bottom line, we've had some tragedies in our facility and we've taken a, a stance on mental health to provide as much mental health uh, coverage or, or treatment or options back there for you know the inmates that we're housing right now. But you know we, we've had some issues back there where people have taken their lives and committed suicide. And that, you know, I, I hate to say this, but that's cost the county some money, a lot of it. You know, getting to the point where we could be uninsurable. Um, Wood County is paying more money for premium costs every year because of the tragedies that have occurred back in our facility. And furthermore, you look at the impact on your staff that have to deal with a tragedy like that. During a short time frame, we lost 18 corrections officers that, that didn't want to work here anymore. And some of those folks had a couple weeks on the job all the way up to 15 years. Really, really good, hardworking people, but having to deal with a tragedy was, was, was too much and they had to move on. And, that, and that's, that's a pretty big impact on our staff and all of us. So we've taken you know, as much strides as we can, you know, investing in mental health and, and going above and beyond. Our correction staff, are, they're awesome. They, they work hard. Um, the state requires us to check on inmates an hour per day. We do it every half hour, just because of the way this facility is, is designed. It's old, it's linear. Um, we need to move in a, in a different direction. Um, it, it, a lot of other questions have come up as well. Like where, where is this going to fit? How are we going to make this happen? Um, you know, first of all, you know, if we're going to have all our inmates here in Wood County under one roof, will we have to hire more people? Yeah, we will. We'll have to hire eight new corrections officers and have at least one maintenance person working um, at this new facility. But here's something that people should understand. Operationally, yeah, will that cost more money? Yeah, close to seven hundred thousand dollars a year. It's it's not cheap to employ people, but go back to what I just said a couple minutes ago. What are we paying out of county housing costs? One point three million. So it's actually a cost savings on the operational side of things. And again, our our out of, our out of county housing is going to go up. Right right now we're paying thirty five dollars a day uh, and thirty six dollars a day at, at at either of these facilities, either you know Pack or Adams County. Um, I can guarantee that that's going to be around $45 a day once we start to negotiate our new contracts. Do the math. It's going to cost us quite a bit more money. And if you project this out longer, if we don't take care of this now, it's going to be more and more and more. Um, the out-of-county housing costs will continue to go up. So if you look at a lot of things that, are, that have been happening and what you know, the Wood County, um, uh, our, our ad hoc committee in dealing with the jail, Dive, dove into this and have answered as many and many questions as, as we can. Uh, we've been out, we've been as transparent as possible. Um, we've been talking about this for over two years. Right? Now it's finally coming to a point where the county board is going to get an opportunity to you know, really absorb this information that we've been putting together and then decide, um, do you want to finance this project moving forward? I hope they do because I don't think as, as leaders um, whether it's the sheriff or, or leaders within our organization or, or county board people, you, you really have to look at, do you want to push this down any further? Um, look at what we've done the last 20 years. What's going to change? The needs will continue to be there. They'll probably even be greater. You know what else is going to change? The cost. Every year that we put this off, the cost is going to go up. And you look at right now, borrowing rates are at historic lows. If the county moves forward with this project and locks in and current interest rates, you're going to save the taxpayers millions of dollars right now. So there's so many things that are, are, are coming together to really seriously consider this project right, right now. And it's not just one. There, there are many of them. So we're looking forward to you know, providing you know, more and more information as we go out, but it, it's been there. I just want to make it very clear we've been transparent. Um, I really applaud the fact of this ad hoc committee of taking this on and especially with our county board. It's not easy. This is probably, as, uh, as our uh, county board chairman had mentioned, this is the, the probably biggest project um, you know, Wood County has is, is taken on in decades. And, but it's needed. You know, it, it really is. And another thing to uh, take a look at or to consider, um, this project, if it moves forward, um, will stay on the courthouse campus. It is imperative that you have this, you know, a facility like this connected you know, to their courthouse. Everything is going on here, in, uh, you know, under one roof or, or close to it. You have, you know, human services close by. You have a hospital close by. Being connected like we are is more efficient and safer. And 
you know, with the remodeling or taking a look at upgrading what we have here in, in the current facility, you have to remember that this facility was built in the 1950s and 1980s under different standards that Department of, of Corrections requires. Now, any type of major remodeling that we do back there, we have to make sure that we're compliant with current Department of Corrections standards. So if we modify any part of, of the facility, maybe expand the uh, um, medical area or mental health area, having to do that will affect uh, potentially or most likely our bed count here because you know, things are different you know, now than they were in the 80s and 50s, obviously. So the more of those bigger projects that we take, whether it's you know, making the Sally Port more um, you know, safer so vehicles can get in and out of there, you have to look at the big picture of, all right, if you want to take on a lot of those projects, that's going to most likely, and it will impact our current inmate population or capacity. So what does that mean in the future? That means we'll have to find more beds to, to put people that should be in our jail somewhere else. And if you look at you know, pre-COVID, we were looking at uh, housing more inmates out because we were full. So, I mean, it's something people should understand that this facility has, we've had to house inmates out of county for a long time. And at the level that we are, you know, when we're going to get to that 100, 100 people out of county even more, that's going to be a huge cost to our county. And then you look at, you know, we, we made a huge investment in inmate programming. You know, so we're providing, you know, mental health opportunities for people while they're in custody that, you know, if they want to, we've got an opportunity for them to get better, to, to work through the issues that they, they have going on, whether it's mental health related, um, alcohol, drug addiction, um, finding work, continuing their education. We can give that, op that, that opportunity to them. And then once released, you know, they have more tools to become successful in the community. And that's a huge, huge win for us. You know, they're going to be here and they're going to do their time. If they do something with themselves while well, we give those opportunities to them and they get out and they're successful, providing for themselves, providing for a family, and paying taxes, that's a huge win for, for everybody that here lives in Wood County. My name is Laura Valenstein. I am the chairperson for the Jail Ed Hoc Committee for the Wood County Board. The discussion started in, 19, in 1999. Um, when they first started talking about the need for a new jail. In 2001, there was a jail study done and uh, there was a vote to approve a $20 million jail of the same size. Um, our needs haven't really changed in 20 years and the um, resolution failed at funding. So it did not get approved. Um, so here we are another 20 years later with essentially the same problem with the same needs and the same size jail is going to cost us um, $56 million. Right now we're spending about depending on the year, 1.2 to 1.4 million dollars annually to house inmates out of county because we don't have the room for them here. So we um, process inmates in through our facility. If we don't have room for them, they get sent to neighboring counties. And then when they are released, they are processed back and released um, in town here in Wisconsin Rapids through our jail. Um, so the goal would be to keep those inmates all local so that we can provide programming for them because while they're housed out of county, we can't give them that kind of programming. So this would be a 225 bed jail with the ability to double up to 85% of the beds or 85% of the bunks to reach a 300 uh, person capacity. Right now, um, we offer things like um, alcohol recovery, drug recovery, um, addiction services. We have some religious services, but we would like to be able to expand that to offer um, more uh, education options more comprehensive um, rehabilitation options, uh, more religious programming, maybe anger management or um, job training in the future. The first two years, there would be a 30 cent increase in the mill rate, which would mean a 30 additional dollars to the county tax per $100,000 of assessed property. After those first two years, it'll be an additional five cents, so we'll reach a maximum of 35 cents on the mill rate. And then after five years, um, that will start decreasing incrementally until the loan is paid off at 20 years. Um, if we do nothing, we will continue to pay those out-of-county housing costs. And we have roughly $5 million of needed repairs that we really need to do to our current jail. Um, and that's not to mention some of the issues that we struggle with, with um, efficiency and our lack of programming space. If we address some of those problems, um, We'll have to adhere to new Department of Corrections codes, which will likely reduce our capacity even further down to about 80 beds instead of the 132 that we're currently at. Um, also, 
the positive thing about building a new jail is that we can, we can control and bond for these costs and um, keep that at a solid number, but we can't bond for operational costs. So if we have a major problem going forward, that's a dollar amount that we can't predict and control. Inmates that aren't housed here um, still need to be transported back and forth for um, necessary court dates. Um, some of that we do, I believe, ourselves, and some of that we contract to bring them back, but they are still required to be tried here and have access to our courts. So that's a major financial concern. Also, because they aren't getting programming, they're not benefiting from their time in jail. They're just biding time until their time is up.